Hello and welcome to Dialogue. The European Commission has announced it will level provisional duties on Chinese EVs, which will range from 17.4% to over 38%. There have been mixed responses so far, with the German car manufacturers saying Chinese responses could cause more harm than the new tariffs are meant to protect. So what's the consideration behind the tariff war? Will the tariffs be able to prevent European consumers' access to high-quality, low-priced Chinese EVs? And uh, what are the likely countermeasures from the Chinese side to protect its interests? Join us for our discussion today, live from Beijing. I'm Xu Qingduo. Joining me today are Fang Dongkui, Secretary General of the China Chamber of Commerce to the EU, and Dr. Alvia uh, Fibre, Senior Research Fellow at the Jacques Delors Institute, Professor Dr. Max Ota, Investor and Entrepreneur, and Professor John Gung from the in the University of International Business and Economics. Welcome to Dialogue. John, I will start with you. So now the tariffs are out. Uh, are you surprised with uh, the rate or, you know, like how high they are? Um, I, I, am, I am surprised. First of all, I'm surprised that uh, uh, Van der Leyen actually started this, initial, started this investigation in the first place. Uh, because none of the European automakers actually making any complaint about this issue. It's, it's, such, it's, it's an entirely initiative on her own. I think it, it's more like a personal crusade. It's just a you know, pet proje political project. This is the first thing I want to say. The second thing is that um, if you look at you know the what's the theory of harm here? There's no theory of harm at all. It's based on a a, a threat to economic injury. So you know it's a theoretical thing. It's a threat to economic injury. And and the, the fact of the matter is that the the parties are supposed to be receiving these injuries are opposed to these measures. You look at the response from Volkswagen, look at the response from uh, BMW, even including a French company, Renault, is opposed to this, right? And, and the third thing I want to say is that, um, you know, based on my uh, sources, um, the, the European Union investigation team are asking questions that are supposed not, not supposed to be asking at all. I mean, they're asking questions concerning the commercial secrets as well as technology secrets about making batteries and things like that. So, you know, I, I'm not sure what's behind this. And, you know, every, every angle I look at this, it, it smells fishy here, you know. So, so I, I'm actually uh, surprised that she started this investigation and the entire rationale behind this is not inherently uh, logical, uh, inherently mm -hmm. consistent. Uh, for example, there's also another calculated tariff for Tesla which is the largest export of electric vehicles from China to European Union. Why is that? Why Tesla is treated very differently from other Chinese manufacturers? As a matter of fact, if these so-called... It's a U.S. company. It's a U.S. company, <laughs> of course. If you are talking about the subsidies um, during the establishment stage, during the development stage, I guess, you know, Tesla actually got a lot of uh, assistance the from, the, in Shanghai. The, the, from the Chinese uh, side, uh, Shanghai municipal government. So why is treated so differently? You know, I think all of these things are very suspicious to me and a mm -hmm. lot of questions raised. And I, I, I want answers for these questions. Yeah, let's bring in uh, Dr. Fabry. Uh, Dr. Fabry, so we have this uh, company specific rate of tariffs, you know, like uh, for uh, BYD and Geely, like, uh, you know, 17.4 uh, or 20. 20% 21% uh, and others of 38%. So what what is it behind this differentiation and also differentiation I would say and also join mentioned this question is there politics or simply economic consideration here? Well the European Commission launched this investigation last October uh, really with the with the intention to have a data-based uh, investigation. So it's not a political process. It's really um, a very, uh, a very accurately uh, calibrated um, investigation. And uh, regarding the question, why do we have different treatments uh, between some big company, big com Chinese uh, EVs productors or other companies? I would say that uh, this is flagging um, uh, the, the importance of those three big companies on the European market and uh, how they could increase their share in the European market. And I guess it's also a question about how, uh, how the companies have been cooperating with the investigators. So this is something on which at the moment we don't already have the full transparency. 
uh, out of the European Commission from external actors to know exactly what's the methodology that, had been, that has been used. Uh, but it's really intended to be um, uh, an investigation based on economic factors and not a political one, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, Max, uh, so you do have, um, I mean, it seems like there are mixed responses even inside the European Union, you know, like ministers of uh, uh, energy like Spain, ministers of industries like uh, Italy, and some other um, uh, parliamentarians of the European Parliament, uh, they, they obviously they say this is the right move to make. But others, uh, like uh, I think you're, where you are from, uh, German, uh, you know, the companies and the government, and also other countries like uh, Hungary, they are n opposed to the decision. Uh, tell us the big picture. What's the consideration here of different opinions? Yeah, you know? Contrary to what the first speaker said, I find it entirely logical what is happening because it's based on political factors. It's based on China's global rise. It's based on the U.S.'s relative decline and Germany, uh, Europe's very large decline. I mean, there's the, the weights are shifting, and in those situations, the powers the, that are, have the dominant position tend to uh, resort to protective measures. I mean, I, I still remember the U.S.-Japanese trade wars from the 1980s and 90s, or um, and the European Commission does not really have so much power um, externally, it, it can uh, very much regulate its own citizens and uh, do bureauc bureaucratic things there. But uh, the two powers it has externally are the trade uh, policy and also the antitrust policy. And so I, I think it's completely logical that in this situation of a deglobalizing de uh, world economy, and I've said this 2006 for the first time that we're going to see a period of deglobalization be based on the broad macroeconomic and political factors. And uh, I said again, 2019, and this is happening. And so these are counter um, active measures by the EU to protect its industries, which will not work in the end because uh, um, the, the, the weights have shifted too much. Uh, and they will do a lot of harm and uh, Germany uh, for one, or the German car manufacturers are against it because they depend on open trade. But unfortunately, the signs in the world economy are set on more restrictive trade. And that's not only this is one issue and it's popping up now, but it's not su no surprise that it is popping up. If you think about it, the US, I mean, there's a clip in the in the Internet where Elon Musk was laughing uh, just about one minute when he was asked 10 years ago about Chinese competition. He was really laughing a lot. And I mean, he was very amused. But now he was the first one to ask for tariffs on 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 Chinese cars. Well, so indeed, this just true. shows how. Yeah, Things indeed, he said that, you know, like, unless you have a tariff war, you cannot stop the Chinese EVs. Now we are having this war. Uh, well, let's, let me turn to uh, Mr. Fong. Uh, so, um, Mr. Fong, of course, you are at the front line representing the Chinese EVs in the European Union. Uh, tell us more about your understanding of this uh, investigation the process. You think it's uh, fair, it's uh, transparent, it's, uh, you know, based on the rules, uh, based on the practice of the international trade? Uh, thank you very much, Shindu, uh, for having me. Uh, as for your, your questions, uh, I want to provide you the following uh, 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 facts and, uh, uh, and truth. Uh, the uh, uh, battery electric vehicles uh, uh, manufactured or the BEV uh, firms, uh, under the, uh, which is uh, uh, under the investigation by the uh, European side, um, have uh, cooperated uh, digitally uh, with the European uh, uh, investigators. Uh, they all have answered the uh, extensive uh, questionnaires uh, to their best um, uh, ability. They also uh, provide the access to the uh, European uh, investigator uh, for their on-site uh, uh, um, uh, investigation uh, both in China and uh, the others uh, in the uh, European countries. Um, and also they, they have provided the necessary uh, information and data to the uh, European uh, investigators. On the other hand, uh, I will also provide the, uh, the findings and observations. Uh, the EU side failed to address the concerns raised by the, uh, uh, the uh, Chinese BEV firms. 
and they fail to uh, adhere to the um, the standards and the uh, uh, across the uh, the uh, the administration, and sometimes uh, it was perceived as the uh, witch hunt during the, uh, the 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 probe. So whether the uh, result is uh, credible, uh, it is a uh, question mark. Mm. Mm -hmm. I, I, I guess uh, uh, Mr. Fong referred to this, uh, some of the practice of this unannounced, uh, unannounced raid, uh, you know, uh, into the, some of the Chinese uh, companies' headquarters in the European Union here. Um, but uh, uh, Dr. Fabry, let me, let me ask you, you know, uh, follow up this question here. You know, Joy mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the, the tariffs are meant to protect the auto industry in the European Union, but the industry, they themselves are opposed to the tariffs. What's the logic here? Well, we have different reactions coming from the European car industry. And uh, as it was mentioned previously, it's right that, uh, for example, you've got some German companies which, are, which were quite opposed to, uh, to any form of tariff. And, uh, and obviously, the tariffs that have been announced are quite higher than what we, uh, we could have expected. Um, and because they, 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 they feel that they can handle the competition uh, within the European markets uh, and that they're able to compete with the, the Chinese imports you know, within, the, within the EU. And I think that we have to keep in mind that even if those tariffs are quite high, once again, higher than what we expected, uh, they, they're reducing the profits that... Uh, uh, that Chinese uh, constructors can can make within the EU, but they are not completely protectionist in the way that they're, they're not uh, closing the European market. And this has obviously been a key, uh, a key factor that has been considered by the European Commission. It has nothing to see with the 100% that was announced on the, on the US side. And for the European companies, the, the idea is that it is giving them a sort of uh, uh, a sort of short leeway uh, to uh, to to engage more peacefully in the competition, uh, but they need to remain uh, exposed to that competition, and that's the whole purpose. They need to uh, to invest themselves more and to be able to to reduce their their prices because the subsidies that have that have been received uh, by the Chinese constructor are one factor. Uh, that is explaining the competitiveness, but it's not the only one. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Fabry, you know, some say the move from the European uh, Commission is really about uh, to encourage the Chinese uh, companies to invest uh, in uh, European Union countries, uh, basically localization to produce and manufacture, uh, of course, you know, to create jobs and pay taxes you know, uh, in foreign investment. Everybody welcomes that. And the others would say this is opening salvo uh, for negotiation with the Chinese side to solve the trade differences or problems between them. Uh, what do you make of that kind of uh, explanation? But I think we can consider both arguments. Uh, one argument is obviously uh, the idea that uh, we would prefer to have the Chinese companies settling in the EU. Uh, but uh, the, the whole objective of the, this uh, subsidies investigation is, uh, is that this is targeting an issue which is uh, really ro deeply rooted uh, at the heart of a level playing field uh, ecosystem. So it is really addressing a concern that the Europeans, and not only the Europeans have, which is uh, how the Chinese state has been supporting uh, in, impressively uh, the, the manufacturing sector and the innovation sector those past years. Uh, so, yes, the, the EU is really focusing on that level playing field issue and, and obviously it, it, it should lead to, uh, to continuous uh, dialogue on those issues. Well, uh, John, I, I, you were shaking your hands, you know, uh, about <laughs> the level playing field. Your, your response? Well, I, you know, the, the, this case is filed under the um, WTO's treaty, what's called SCM treaty, countervailing treaty. Um, and the idea is that, you know, these subsidies should be related to exports only, specific exports only, right? Now, the thing is that if these subsidies or, you know, assistance from the state and the Chinese government are for the exports only, you would logically expect the cars sold in Europe should be cheaper than the cars 
being sold here in Chinese domestic market, right? Mm -hmm. But but the, the truth is, the fact is exact the opposite, actually. I mean, the European cars for the same model are almost as twice as expensive the cars uh, compared to the cars being sold here in China. So where are the subsidies go, right? So, you know, this is just not very logical to me at all. Um, a, a, another issue is that, uh, um, you know, the subsidies uh, associated with, for example, during the development stage, uh, one example was mentioned in the public release from the European Union is respect to the quality of land, for example, for establishing the factory. You know, these like early stage costs, um, state subsidies, is actually falling into the gray zone for the, uh, under the SCM treaty. Um, you know, for example, look at Airbus. You know, 18 billion, 20 billion dollars have been already provided by the European Union to subsidize the, the venture of Airbus in the earlier stages, right? And, and this is actually an issue that has been sort of litigated and, and, and not right. directly falling into the you know, clearly defined uh, state subsidy under the SCM treaty. Uh, according to the WTO rules. So, so, you know, if you look at these two perspectives, I'm really not sure whether, you know, there exists a serious subsidy issue here. Um, the, 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 you know, the claims to me seem to be quite questionable. Uh, and also, you know, the fact of the matter that uh, the cars being sold in Europe are way more expensive than cars being here sold in China, um, mm -hmm. you know, doesn't tell me that there's subsidy here. If there's any leveling playing field here, I think, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, it's actually favoring the, uh, the European market. Mm -hmm. What I matter. Right. Well, uh, for that matter, uh, of course, let's assume Max say the European Commission move is to uh, say incentivize the Chinese companies to invest and localize their production inside the European Union. Um, but of course, we are seeing is that there is a concentration of the Chinese investment in Hungary, the Eastern European uh, country, instead of say Germany, France, and other uh, like Italy or of Spain. Um, are there any move or are there any policies to attract the Chinese investment for like countries probably in western part of the European continent? I'm not really into the minutes and details of this, but generally, of course, the mood has been one of hostility almost. Um, there's this review process for uh, Chinese direct investments that was, uh, for example, instituted or exercised during KUKA, which was a robotics manufacturer that was uh, bought by Ch Chinese investors. There's quite a bit of Chinese investment in Germany, but the official uh, sources discourage it. And uh, I mean, um, I think Europe should be open. I mean, we have a lot of US direct investment. We have a lot of Western investment. I think Europe's place should be in the middle and it should be an open place. But um, current policies rather discourage than encourage uh, Chinese foreign direct investment in, in Germany, in Europe. Yeah, of course, uh, there's a de-risking policy. Yeah, you know, like a procedure for a scrutiny of the you know, investment in China or investment from China, right? Right, right. So, so Hungary is an exception, and we do have a significant uh, amount of Chinese direct investment. So, but even if, let's say, those tariffs do encourage car manufacturers to invest in Europe, which is already happening in different space for, for Chinese companies in Mexico, because Mexico is within NAFTA, so Chinese inv is invest China is investing quite heavily in, in, in Mexico. But even if this is happening, it would still be uh, somewhat of a resourcing of a deglobalization, so it would also support my original thesis. So we have a process of deglobalization rather than globalization going on, and, and higher barriers between the trading blocks. Mm -hmm. Wow, well, this is a larger picture, uh, you know, of this global situation. Uh, Mr. Fong, you know, like, uh, tell us you know, what's the response from I don't know, like what will happen to the Chinese company, and uh, you know whether they will continue. Uh, to invest and develop in the European markets? Uh, okay, uh, for the uh, European market, uh, it, it is uh, uh, attractive and will be attractive to the Chinese BEV uh, manufacturers. The reason is uh, as follows. Uh, number one, because of the political concerns to uh, address the uh, climate change goals. Uh, they uh, the uh, because of the uh, you know to uh, address the uh, such a goals, the Chinese BV firms have a huge potential to provide such the public goods to to facilitate the green transformation 
in the uh, European uh, uh, countries. And number two is because uh, the European Union is a huge uh, consumer market. So uh, the, the BEV ma ma manufacturers can benefit from such a market. And number three is because of the competition. Uh, Europeans have a lot of the uh, uh, competitors, so they can uh, compete in such a market you know, to uh, make their products more better and more uh, qualified for the uh, consumers. Mm -hmm. uh, we're joined, of course, you know, with tariffs like, uh, you know, 17.4% or 20% or 21 in general, 38% right. for some companies. Are those tariffs enough to, say, prevent the Chinese companies from entering the European market? Well, I think at 20%, still Chinese companies can make some money on the European market. But let me also point out, ultimately, it's the consumers in Europe that are actually paying for this. They are suffering. Uh, and also the uh, European climate agenda is being hampered by these tariffs. The Green Deal, right? Exactly. And, and uh, I think, ultimately, you know, the entire European auto industry will fall victim to this. This is going to be, it's going to slow in their process. They, you know, they don't get to have this competition to incentivize them to invest more in development of this you know, state-of-art EVs and are lagging behind. And you know, protectionist measures will never work to save the industry according to history precedents. And I think ultimately it's the European auto industry itself is going to be fall to the victim of the stupid policies from the European Union Commission. Mm -hmm. uh, Max, uh, do you think that the protectionism will work to protect the auto industry to develop EVs of the European uh, like, uh, you know, countries, European companies there? No, of course not. Um, I mean, it was the uh, German Friedrich List who uh, talked about tariff policies to protect industries in the first half of the 19th century. So, I mean, in some ways you can have, if you have uh, an emerging e economy, if you have an, an uh, momentum, you can do that. But if you have a declining industry, if, if the business model is broken, and unfortunately, uh, Germany's and Europe's business model is, is heavily sh uh, shaken and, and sometimes broken, it, it will not work. Of course not. Mm -hmm. uh, well, of course, uh, you know, people are also looking at uh, what will be the possible response from the Chinese side, John. Uh, already people mentioned about the investigation into the French uh, Cognac and other dairy products. Uh, uh, you think there will be, uh, say, retaliation from the Chinese side? Or? Well, uh, you know, let's just be very honest that the, the parties who are actually really behind this are the French government, the Spanish government to some extent, actually, because these French companies have uh, operations, uh, subsidiary operations uh, in, in Spain, are concerned about these jobs being gone, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, Chinese response is, uh, you know, understandably targeting uh, the French products. Uh, uh, ultimately, I, I don't think that, uh, you know, tit for tat is a good strategy. I mean, if they're looking for um, localization of production in Europe, that's fine, I think. It's something, I mean, it's good that this already, uh, this is only provisional. So there's still some hope that things can be worked out. And I would hope that things can be worked out, that, uh, you know, Chinese companies can go to Europe, they go to Spain, go to France, to establish factories and, and, and jointly uh, produce cars together. Now remember, in the late 1980s, early 1990s, we were sort of in the same situation in Europe. We opened our market to invite European automakers to come to China, to establish joint ventures, right? And we actually benefit immensely from this. We didn't establish a war to, to protect these uh, foreign uh, companies. Chinese companies, we, all right. Exactly. I mean, we actually embraced these foreign investors. and, and Embraced and, the competition. And, and after all these years, you know, the Chinese auto industry has entirely transformed itself. And I think that, you know, I, I would strongly recommend uh, these European politicians to, to, to take a page from the history of Chinese automobile industry development and, and learn from that. And, and I think, you know, embracing Chinese companies, uh, welcome the joint ventures uh, and welcome foreign direct investment from China and transform the auto industry in Europe. That's the way to, I think that's the way out actually. And mm -hmm. hopefully the, the two governments, the two sides will be talking about this and get rid of this so-called provisional tariffs in my the, view. Right. I mean, even say the Chinese companies, they, are, or they will continue to do investment and to localize their production in the European countries. Max, you know, given this high energy prices, I mean, I don't think that it will be solved, you know, in terms of the energy shortage because of the relationship with, 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 with Russia, because of the lack of relationship with Russia, uh, rather. Uh, you think that's the ideal place probably for, is it the ideal place for the foreign investors in, in the European Union now? Of course not. I see a number of motives. First, of course, there's the motive for the EU uh, commission and the EU policymakers to to exercise some power to do something to make themselves more important. 
But uh, even if there was an economic rationale, I mean, uh, companies are leaving Germany uh, by the score. Germany has the most stupid industrial policy of er any industrialized nation in the in the world. I mean, it's it's just uh, mind boggling how stupid. Uh, the green uh, influence policy is in Germany. So no, um, I I would not move to Germany for manufacturing at this point, it's, it, except for for very specific uh, niches. Some of the Mittelstands companies are still working despite all of the burdens that are put upon them. Some of, of uh, Germany's Mittelstand and some of the strengths are still there, but they're going fast. And of course, it's not a good place to start a new venture, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. Well, there are some challenges. Uh, John, you know, the U.S. imposed like more than 100 percent of tariffs on the Chinese companies. Uh, well, the European Union, like 20, 20 percent. Uh, uh, so it seems like their, their, their goals or their purposes are a bit different. And also, you know, is there any leeway you know, for the Chinese side and the European side to find a common ground, to, find, to make even some concessions probably to reach a, a solution? Um, yeah, I, I think so. I think um, um, you know there's a, there's a room for negotiation. As a matter of fact, it is a Chinese company already promised to uh, committed to uh, start production in Spain. That's the Cherry Automobile uh, from Manhui Province, right? So that's an example there. And there are also other Chinese companies uh, starting to uh, um, you know make cars uh, in Europe, including uh, for example BYD has made a commitment in Hungary, right? So that's a um, that's another example. So I think um, you know there's a room for negotiation and, and things can be working out. I think the situation in respect to Europe is totally different from the situation in the United States. The United States. In, in the United States over there, Tell they, us more they, about they, that. they just don't want any car. Any car. I mean, they, they don't call Chinese cars importing into the United States. Uh. They call it invasion, okay? <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, in the U.S., I think it is totally hopeless. The polit political environment is totally hopeless for Chinese cars to, uh, to thrive there. Well, uh, <coughs> Let's imagine, Max, you know, okay, no EVs um, is from the Chinese side or from other parts of the world because of the U.S. subsidy is really to subsidize cars produced in North America, in Canada, U.S. or Mexico, not from Asian countries, including China, not from European countries. Uh, so what will happen, you know, like, I don't know, five years from now or 10 years from now? Uh, so it's simply the, the, the U.S. companies there? Uh, mostly, I mean, the, Europe right now is more or less, uh, I mean, the uh, European Commission, the commissioners have some power, they can impose tariffs and so on. But of course, the influence of the US lobby is strong. And let's say regarding high tech, Europe is already has been a data colony of the US for the past uh, decades, even for the past two decades, it's very strong now. So the US high tech companies are totally dominating Europe. and. Uh, the way the, those asymmetric policies are being continued, it's probably going to be the same thing with, with uh, EV manufacturers. My scenario in my last book was that we have uh, uh, two blocks. We have a new Chinese block. We have a few independent countries or regional powers. We have a, a Western block, which is the US and Europe, but Europe completely integrated into the US economy or more or less integrated. That was my a future outlook and so yes probably if if, it, if we go that way most of the um, EVs will be uh, US EVs or EVs by US companies in 10 years if we go that route. Well we will see. Uh, with that we come to the end for today's show. Many thanks to our guests. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. Thank you for being with us. I'm Xu Qianduo. See you next time. <laughs>